Hello, this is uh, Katrina Manchanda, the John and Mary Shirley Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Seattle Art Museum. And it is my great pleasure to introduce you all to Barbara Earl Thomas. We will be in conversation shortly about her new body of work. Based here in Seattle, Barbara Earl Thomas is a celebrated artist and writer. She received both her BA and MFA from the University of Washington where she studied and became close friends with both Michael Spafford and Jacob Lawrence. Before her graduation in 1977 with her MFA, she also spent time in France studying at the uh, University of Grenoble and uh, presumably um, deepening her knowledge in French. In addition to building her career as an artist in painting and printmaking in the decades subsequently, Thomas worked at the Seattle Arts Commission and um, more recently, after the opening of the Northwest uh, African American Museum, she served as the museum's executive director for a number of years. Our conversation today will focus on the new work that Barbara L. Thomas is making for her upcoming exhibition called The Geography of Innocence at the Seattle Art Museum which is scheduled to open in November. So before we begin, I want to note Thomas's family roots in the American South and its many cultural and spiritual traditions. I mention it here because she credits her passion for narrative and stories, which are evident in her visual work as much as in her writing, to the cultural traditions of the South. I also want to underscore her dual passion for art and literature, visual production and writing. Um, she writes on contemporary art and culture, on nature and travel, and uh, has published monographs on Gwendolyn Knight Lawrence, um, Joe, Joe Federson, Happy Thompson and Julie Spidell, amongst others. Her email uh, signature notes simply, Barbara Earl Thomas, artist, writer, thinker, I think um, on your website, you insightfully note that you maintain a consistent practice of including the world in your art and your life in the world. I really love that. And I think it's a great a jumping off point here. But before we launch into our little conversation, I should also note, so Barbara Earl Thomas and Sandra Dumont uh, Jackson dreamt up the Jacob Lawrence and uh, uh, Gwendolyn uh, Knight Lawrence uh, Prize. Some years ago, the first one uh, was in 2009. And of course, that award that we're also very proud of celebrates uh, a young uh, black artist uh, every two years. And Aaron Fowler is still on view at the museum right now. I just um, want to uh, note that as well. But today, our big focus is on Barbara O. Thomas and the geography of innocence. Barbara, welcome. Well, thank you. I was so excited to have you introduce me. I, you know, you've never done that before, and I'm glad to be here to be introduced. Thank you so much. Well, it's really a pleasure. We have been in conversation about the history of colonialization, colonialism, the lives of Black people in the United States for some time. Often we've carried on conversations in person. More recently, uh, those conversations have moved to the phone and, um, and oftentimes those are followed by emails. I returned to one of your emails from last year where you described this history, this American history as an old untended wound. The Geography of Innocence is the title of your upcoming exhibition at SAM. Tell us, how did you decide on this title? Well, you know, um, the, the titles of my work are, how I come to them is really an interesting thing. It's like, I start to work, I start to work. And then in the cutting, all of a sudden, it's clear to me what I'm doing. I never start with, I sometimes start with an idea and go like, this is what I'm doing, but I always depend on the process giving me the, um, I don't know, give me the information I need to tell me really what I'm doing. It's part of the um, intuitive, spiritual, matter, meeting, skill, and intent. And um, I, when we were talking about the, 
the United States and talking about, and I just want to note that we started this conversation, it's almost over a year ago. So this is not anything that's, you know, based on this moment, but it's ongoing. Um, I was thinking about the whole idea of our own perception and what we see when we see another person, when we come into contact with them. And I was thinking about the whole idea of how we read another's existence. We talked a little bit too about the whole idea of light and dark. And what, what does it mean when someone encounters the idea of darkness and the idea of lightness and what we, what we imbue the whole concept of lightness as being? the good, the light, the, the angelic, the innocent, and then what we imbue in the dark, which is mystery and intrigue and sometimes a little danger. And um, so I wanted to work with those two, um, you know, those two kind of forces because one needs the other. And then also the idea of reading and what is, what is it when we're trying to find ourselves? When we're trying to find ourselves, in the geography, not just literal geography, but in emotional ge geography of how we encounter a face and what it does when it tells us whether something is good or bad or evil or scary. And so I thought a lot about that. And we did talk about you know, the actual incidents that got me to this whole idea of, of uh, the geography of innocence and, and actually started with the incident of the Sandy Hook shooting, where a man went into a school and he shot several, just several children. And I thought at that moment, you know, if this moment in history doesn't cause us to think deeply about the violence that, you know, is perpetuated in our culture, doesn't make us think more deeply about how we as adults you know, walk through the world and, respond, and our responsibility in it, then nothing will. Well, we went through the whole, you know, uproar and then the die down and everything and lots of articles came out. But one of the articles that came out of that whole discussion, uh, I was reading it and a woman, a, I just assume a very nice woman, she said, you know, it's really interesting. All those children got killed. And she said, and I think about, because it was a, a wide range of children, you know, children of color, black, white, everyone. She said, but I don't know what it is about uh, these murders that happened, but when I hear that a black child has died, I don't experience the same level of grief. I don't experience this. I'm, I'm not as saddened by it. And she just went on in the article and I just thought, wow, that's tremendous. That is a very heavy statement to say. And I thought, well, of course, um, going and looking at a lot of the, the killings and the whether it be Tra Trayvon Martin or, um, you know, the, the, the killing in, in uh, where was it, in Ferguson, and some of the things that the officer said about, you know, that young man, he just kept coming and he kept coming like he was not even human. And I thought, you know, we've got a lot riding on that. And so how do we find ourselves in this uh, idea of how we read the face of a young person, especially a child, and why people see something that's a little bit more, um, knowing in the child of, of, a, of a young child of color. Mm -hmm. So this is where the, the title comes from. And I remember even in your earliest notes, your thoughts uh, for the exhibition at Sam, you recounted that memory of this um, person reporting this uh, personal emotional response, which which is so chilling and really it, it goes to the core of what you're trying to address in the different works in this exhibition. So we've been looking at uh, one of your um, uh, cut paper pieces, gorgeous portrait, and the person is holding the sign Grace. Now we also have um, 
one of the source, the, the source image for this work, or maybe I should say one of the source images, I'm not quite sure, but I think this is really the, uh, the key one, which is uh, on your studio walls, pinned there amongst other things. Do you want to talk a little bit about the source image and um, the history of this particular work? Well, you know, I, um, after, you know, after that whole event with Sandy Hook, and then it's just sort of my, the every day I took to like just researching, you know, the, the don't shoot campaign. It actually was a campaign that was in Detroit. I think it was part of it was in Chicago and, you know, they get these children and talk about, you know, don't shoot. We want to grow up. Don't shoot. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a bad person. And I thought, you know, when I was doing, creating that image, Grace, I thought, you know, there's that kid holding the sign and it says, don't shoot. I said, well, you know, that is what I want. don't want. I don't want that. I don't want them to shoot. But I said, but what if I could decide what I do want? What if I had my child say what I want as opposed to what I don't want to happen? And I actually had a number of words that I kept. I just went through and I just made these words. What do I want? I want love. I want, you know, I want, you know, uh, sort of a halt. I want hesitation. And then I kept going through words and I finally kept, I came down to the word grace. And the word grace means to me, it's a moment of, of a rest. One stops one takes a breath, one considers the next move and interrupts it. And then you get an opportunity to change the outcome. And grace for me, it's not just grace for the child, it's grace for the person who's committing the incident. You know, it's grace for the person who's committing the incident because it's not just that you lose the young person or the person who's being you know, involved being shot or being, you know, choked. The person who commits that um, act also loses. And so we're in the act of saving more than one life. So grace is what I wanted and an opportunity. It's like I, we talked a little bit about Rashomon, that, the, the, that Japanese film, the Kurosawa, where he has the three different endings in the same event. And I kept thinking, hmm, you know, nothing new. We could, it's, it's a thought that's in the world. And so grace, and also I like the way it looked. One word, because don't shoot. I'm always thinking about alliteration and how many syllables something has and how one word can have so much in it that it gives you a, gives you a sense in a picture. I'm just always so impressed how you think about society as a whole, not just, you know, the children, the victims, but the perpetrators and how, how everyone is tied in that same history and how the, the importance of moving forward with grace, in grace. I mean, to me, this is just such an extraordinary work. And here is another one actually showing you at work here on Boys in uh, Nightlight, um, a very animated uh, kind of street scene behind them and the two of them embracing in the foreground. In the foreground. So the exhibition itself that, you, that, that we've been planning will be in two adjoining uh, galleries. And in the first one, that first gallery is dedicated to um, these portraits of young boys and children. Can you tell us about, um, you know, your decision uh, for um, the subject matter, um, just focusing on uh, the children and um, and the young people in that first gallery? Well, that was um, it was interesting because I did start with the you know that don't shoot kind of campaign, mm -hmm. and then as I was going and cutting, and I thought I realize that I have a lot of people in my in my life who have children and what would be the act of saving the children I knew 
And so I went around among my friends and, you know, associates and I found images of these are children that I know. These are the children of my studio assistant, uh, Peggy um, Allen Jackson. And I thought, I would want to save them. I would want to save your kids. And I feel like that's the whole point. And so in a way, it added an extra sort of feeling of urgency to the work for me. And it wasn't when I was, we talked and I was telling you about, you know, thinking about, you know, the Renaissance and, and some of those paintings where the, the rich kind of homeowners would have a painter come in and paint all of the things that were in the holding of that rich um, uh, patron. So you just, they'd line up all their stuff, their rugs and their whatever, and their kids and their family, and they put it all in one big image. Mm -hmm. And so that they could show the world, these are the things that are in my world that sort of define what I care about and define what I have. And so I thought of this in, in a similar way. I said, I'm just gonna go around and collect the images of all the people that I love and start cutting them and see how, how that adds to the resonance of what I'm doing. So, um, and what I am finding is that I, I find something in trying to also simplify because the cutting, using the actual knife as my drawing tool, I have to be really selective because I don't get to do all the things I get to do like when I'm drawing and I can just shade and I can do all the things that I really like to overdo. And so it, it, it creates a kind of a really direct, immediate drama. Right. We're going to get back to the process in a, uh, in a little while. But first, this one, um, this is a work that I'm not quite sure if it was finished bec before the coronavirus uh, hit and everything um, kind of slowed down. But I do know that you added so much more detail to this piece. So this is color wheel uh, that you just finished. So yeah. it's, a, it's a work from, um, well, the last, th this year or the last few months. And I just want to start by asking you about storytelling and uh, narrative, which really is so central uh, to your work. And there are so many complex layers there, personal history, mythology, literature, all of those can be woven together, um, you know, in, in a single image sometimes in your work. Can you expand on your interest in narrative a little bit? Well, I think that, you know, for me, everything is a story. And people, we as human beings, we are natural story makers. You know, our lives really, we don't have a story. Our lives really don't have a story with an arc or anything. But to make the world make sense to us, we are always creating stories, you know, about how or why something happened to us so we can hold it and, and not be frightened by the fact that we really are living sort of a sequence of just separate acts all the time. And I'm a reader and I, and I thought about, again, about these, this young boy in this, in this piece, his name is actually Levi. He's the grandson of one of my cousins and he was in town for my aunt's 100th birthday last year. And I just took a snapshot of him and I said, I think I might do something with him. And I, as I was going along, I, there was something compelling about him when I asked him to put his hand just up by his heart. And he just, just did whatever I asked him to do, which was another thing that has to do with this whole idea of innocence. I think that the idea of how we see young, uh, young kids of color, especially the young black kids, is that it's not, it's not necessarily the face that gets put to the public, either in film or in um, you know, advertisement or in, um, in, 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 in lots of things. And so I thought, here's an opportunity to show what I see when I'm encountering these children. And he just did anything I asked him to do because he trusts me. And I wanted to show that trust to my viewer. And then also I went back and I started thinking about all the stories around young black boys and ones that have stayed with me over the years. And of course I thought of black, you know, uh, Richard Wright. And then I thought of 
James Baldwin, which if you'll see up in the corner, my color wheel just kind of covers notes of a native son. And then uh, went down to the Ta-Nehisi Coates between the world and me. And I always think about words and titles and how they make the viewer see things differently. If I had just called this, you know, if I had not put the, the, the book titles, you know, people would have, they'll, they'll, they would see it differently. They really would. And, uh, but I wanted the, um, the titles to be part of the embedded narrative of the story. And um, so I had, and then also there are things that are in my studio. So the color wheel was just on the wall. It was well, just- let's look, at that. Let, let's look at the color wheel. We have a nice uh, detail that you yeah. uh, sent us yeah. because you really need to, I mean, there's so much detail in these uh, paper cut works. So for those who have a hard time reading here, this is like on the top left, it says adding black mm -hmm. and then further down adding white and it adds up to that color wheel. And we also have, I think it's it's right there in the middle somewhere. Yeah, right there in the middle. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. There's another one that's right above his head. If you get right there. Right there, there right? Yeah, above his head. Right. And here is that photograph. It's yeah. just such a striking uh, image. And I'm also just struck by the amount of trust, right? For somebody who can look at you in, in such a disarming way, you just know that the person opposite who's behind the camera is mm -hmm. somebody that um, he would be just trusting. It's, it's even as a photograph, it's striking, but the, um, uh, the, the finished work is just extraordinary. Um, so yes, so you said the color wheel, remind me, did that, so was that added into the work later on as you were already working on it? Yeah, and I said, I was looking at the where I had the photo and I was kind of thinking, oh, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna add in the things that are on the wall. And then I thought, oh God, there's that color wheel. And so I just went over and I made a, I cut out a, a replica of my color wheel. And then I noticed on the top, it said add white, because of course it's shade, add black, you know, to the hue. And I thought, well, that seems kind of meaningful, very meaningful. And I just let those things stand for themselves. And actually the, the, uh, there was a ruler on the, on the uh, wall behind him. And I thought, well, I just need this ruler to be part of my composition. So I made it do what I needed to do. I kind of cut it in half. And, um, and I just let sort of chance, what things that were chance, Work in there, and you'll see if you look right on the wall there, you see Tanahisi Coates. The the back spine of his name is on the spine of a that was going to be on the book, and I was going to put his name in, and I thought, no, I just want the titles of the book. So there are all these decisions that you're making along the way, you know, decisions that you that start, and then the decision is, I just want the title of the book. So for people that know this work, that work will mean those words will mean something to them. For people who don't know that work, they will read the work differently. And um, okay. I, I don't need them to know that necessarily, but for people who do, it will add an extra layer to the work. Yeah, and I'm glad that you brought up the measure too. I mean, I was just so struck by the color wheel because, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a painter's tool, right? For determining perhaps, you know, how you want to mix colors or shading. But of course, in this context, the, this subject matter, it acquires an entirely uh, different reading. Yeah. And if we, if we go to um, those three um, literary references to Richard Wright, like boy, it was interesting uh, looking up again that this uh, book was actually published in a couple of different parts. So the first part published in 1945. And I was just so struck by the different kinds of book covers. I mean, it, this is just a random sampling that I ran across, which tell us also so much, um, you know, over time with how an author and a story is being framed. So, I mean, it, like Boy was autobiographical. It was very much about Wright's own uh, very traumatic upbringing uh, in the South. Uh, 
hunger, abuse, racism, rampant on, on all of these different levels. That was your starting point. Um, so I'm curious about your choice of these three. I just want to show people here we have uh, James Baldwin. And, um, you know, it, it, it was so interesting. Again, I mean, there, there's also so smart in your choice because there are cross references going back and forth because Wright um, was at least for a short time um, influential for Baldwin. They knew each other. Um, I think even maybe a little bit of a mentor role for a short amount of time. But then James Baldwin is critical of uh, um, Wright's book, um, uh, you know, uh, his own reflection on um, the uh, native son. And then that relationship uh, changes. And for Ta-Nehisi Coates, he again quotes a poem by Richard Wright in his, uh, as an ep epitaph uh, in the very beginning. And it's actually a poem that again is reflected, you know, in the title of Ta-Nehisi Coates' book, Between the World and Me. And it's a poem about lynching. So, I mean, that the cross references across generations between these three writers is really startling. And I'm just so curious about your own thought process as a reader, as somebody who thinks deeply in selecting these three works uh, to be included and referenced in the color wheel. Oh. Well, I think for me, um, in thinking about these works, because Black Boy and, um, and Notes of a Native Son, I've read so many times. And I, uh, one of the things that I did um, was in, I think it was 2013, I went back and sort of reread just a large body of work of James Baldwin because I got into this, like, let me reread some of the work that was really seminal in my life and read it now, um, you know, 35, 40 years later from the first time I read it to see how it still feels. And then I'd read, it really, I, I had a really hard time reading Between the World and Me because it was so tender and it was so kind of heart-wrenching. So I could read parts of it and I'd have to put it down. And then, and then to think that all the time that was between the Richard Wright, the James Baldwin and the Ta-Nehisi Coates, I thought, what, what, where have we been? What, what roads or, or landscape have we traversed since, you know, 1945 to 19, you know, to 2015? And what kind of perceptions have changed? What experiences for this particular, you know, this young, these young men, what has, what has changed and what has not changed? So I wanted to link them kind of in a triad as part of the narrative for here is the geography of this young black boy and how will his life be different in 25 or 30 years or the same. And one of the things that happened most recently with kind of um, uh, the latest incident um, of, 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 the, of the, the killing of Floyd, was that Ta-Nehisi Coates was quoted as saying, I mean, in the midst of all this, we're in the middle of COVID-19, the pandemic, I call it our plague. We are having social upheaval because of these, a series of incidents that happened so quickly that people could not ignore them. And then in the middle of all of that, Ta-Nehisi Coates says, I'm feeling hopeful for the first time in my life to feel hopeful at this moment in history with all of those things that have just that I've just listed astounds me and i had put his his um book in my um in my image before that but i just thought you know this is a narrative and it's a narrative that's in and out of my work and i also thought that in a way i see all of the ways we express ourselves as tied together and in context with one another. I don't see visual art over here and literary art over there and dance on the other side. They're all communicating and 
at least are communicating to me. I mean, maybe I'm over here having a seance in the studio and, you know, being, you know, you know, just occupied. But um, I wanted to just say that very clearly and say it in words and have the words be design elements and have the words wrap around this young person who has an open landscape on his face and we have the opportunity to help him have a different experience and that's again where my grace i'm i'm, I'm hoping to have grace there and um the, and like i said the 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 ruler and you know sometimes artists do this i needed so I, I need things to intersect my, my verticals. I need my verticals to be intersected by, you know, diagonals and, you know, you look at Rembrandt's, you know, Night Watch, those standards that all the men were using when they marched out in the middle of the, um, of the courtyard. They were probably to protect something, but they were also there to hold that composition down and make it a little more dynamic. So I, that's part of what I'm, I'm doing as well. Yeah, so we want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, composition and process, but I just want to say one more time, you know, just like the color wheel, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the ruler or the measure opens up so many doors, at least in my mind, for interpretation, right? Because what are, you know, how do we measure? Um, hey. And you can apply that, I mean, in so many different directions, but to me, it's a very significant element um, in, in this particular work. But I just wanted to go back because you, um, you spent a lot of time studying and working in printmaking, and you've developed a very, un to my mind anyhow, a very unique artistic process here, which seems to be going back and forth between, well, what looks like drawing, collage, and, and perhaps the first step of printmaking, if you would think of something like a woodcut where you kind of cut into the wood and you, um, you know, and, and what you take out becomes like the, the white um, space that would otherwise get printed. But here you have this black design that you cut and then behind it, you layer it with these different colors. So explain it a little bit, how you work. Um, and I mean, of course the video illustrates uh, this too, but then also how did you arrive at this particular process? Well, that's really interesting too, because I think that um, for me, I was, a, I am, I do make prints and I am a printmaker. And I think of printmaking as being a very kind of literary, it's a literary, kind of artwork because you, you, you're cutting it. Of course, printmaking was about early, about printing words. You know, it's about printing images for people who couldn't read uh, so that they could come and look in the printer's window on Monday to see the crazy thing the king, the king did last week and to, to kind of give them uh, a way to see their own world. So for me, the, the print, um, it's, it's very graphic and also I always say I have a very strong arm and a very strong sort of graphic impulse. So I started doing these block cuts because I needed something to interrupt, you know, how strong my hand was. So I take my, my Japanese cutting tool and I start cutting into the lino and all of a sudden I had to be more selective about the cut. I had to be uh, more sure about the thing I wanted, but then I also had to be confident because you can't overthink it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started with that and I would have a color underneath. So it would just be two part, very simple. I had a color underneath that my printer would do kind of a, a, a gradual, what we call a rainbow roll behind on one sheet and then I'd print the black on top. And then I started doing glass. And I had a really great opportunity in 20, 13 to be in residence at the Tacoma Glass Museum. And all of a sudden I said, I wanted to do glass because my work is all about light. I said, oh my God, I get to do glass and, and light comes through the glass. And, um, and when I was there, I was asking them about what, how I might, not being a glass person, actually feel about this glass. And they said, well, you know, your work really 
uh, is also um, very amenable to sandblasting, which in a way you put the, the black on top and all of a sudden you have this, what do you call it? You have this thing that looks like a print. And I thought, well, God, that's another thing I'm doing. It looks like a print. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when I went back to doing my, uh, my, my paper cuts, I wanted to have the light that came from the glass. And so I was trying to figure out, okay, I don't have all these fabulous glass blowers and all these people with uh, 11,000 degree ovens and all of that, but how can I make light happen? And so this, this uh, process that I worked, the paper, the color you see is actually hand printed color and it's just in sheets. And so I put it behind the uh, black cutouts that I'm doing and then I layer the paper and then I cut down through it so that you have a one, this piece actually right here, it's, it's, it's still in process when you see it again, Katrina, it'll really be that. And um, so I'll put a piece on top and I'll cut through so you can see the color down and through. And um, then you take that off so that I might have a darker orange and underneath is a lighter orange and underneath that is even a lighter orange and I have to cut through each layer of paper to reveal the piece of paper underneath. And, um, and it was just something that I designed, I kind of created to get that feeling that I got when I did glass, but didn't have glass. But the, and I wanted it to glow. And I, exactly, and I'm so glad you mentioned the glass and the idea of light and illumination because in this case, it really feels as if the, the scene is almost, well, it's not only that the scene is backlit, but it's almost as if the, Im the image itself is emanating light, um, which is just uh, really astounding. And it, perhaps we can take that then as a jumping off point to um, this other body of work. So here, in this case, you're not cutting in paper, but you're using this white Tyvek yes. for these large hanging uh, structure. This one here is called Man Down from uh, 2019. Let me, um, let me first start with uh, one question that has been um, on my mind because you, especially for those Tyvek people, uh, pieces, you've noted how collaborative work is really important for you. Um, or I think the way you have put it is to have different hands engaged in the making of these works is, um, uh, is significant. Can you explain your thoughts about that? Well, um, at some, at one point, at some point I realized that um, my vision for making these sort of very illuminated sort of small vignettes I looked at one of them and I said, you know what? I would really like to walk around in that space. I would really like to have people be inside of this idea of illumination that I feel. And I said, well, in order to do that, I need to make things really two or three times life size in order to make it feel that way. And in order for me to do that, I have to have help. And in order for me to have help, I have to let go of whatever control that I think I have needed to have in order to have things look just the way I want them to look. And what I found in the process was that um, there's a richness that comes when there are a number of different people touching and moving around. And so what I would do is, um, and you know, it was a discovery for me. I mean, I think that what I learned in glass, which is so collaborative, nobody does glass alone. You know, everybody has to be in on the on the fix. You know, if someone's gotta get the frit and the, the glass, they've gotta have a space that has all of this intense uh, resource in it. Then you have to have people who know how to handle it and then you if, if in my case you know being the artist i needed to be able to figure out what is something that can be made in glass then when i'm right in the middle of it someone looks at it and says well this is how this could work better in glass then i had to be able to translate that and all of a sudden it was like it was like being in a um in an orchestra 
-hmm. You know, it's like being improvising in an orchestra and you have to think really fast and you have to move, you know, on the moment and you have to be willing to make a mistake and then figure out how to correct that. So when I got ready to do these large pieces, I went and I talked to some people um, who cut in Tyvek. I talked to Celeste Kooning. I talked to a few other people and they were very generous. And I said, okay, I think what I want to do is make a, a big thing. And I just called in people that were not necessarily artists. And I said, you, I have a knife here for you and I have some shapes I want you to cut. And I want to see how you feel about that. And so what we would do, we, my, my tables are eight feet long. I'd have three people around the table and I'd give them kind of a, a shape to cut. And then they'd cut and then I'd say, okay, let's everyone move so that no one gets too involved in his or her one little area. And I've been, I, I was amazed watching, uh, well, this was before the virus uh, pandemic, but visiting you in the studio and, and seeing several people work with you in the studio. And I was just amazed that you didn't put a drawing down for others where they have to cut it out, but you were just explaining, oh, just follow that, that flow, you know, do it this way or that way and then people would just go with a knife and cut it I think I would be way too afraid of making a mistake but it was just really wonderful to see how organically you work together but I thought also why don't you because the idea is really that you walk around the space or walk into um, the space which really is like this illuminated um, tower when you walk around do you want to um, talk just briefly about the subject matter because we can only see it from one side here. Well, this piece, Man Down, I made in 2019 because I was thinking again, you know, here we are in um, at this period in our life and we're, you know, we're talking about sort of the issues in our community, the issues in our country and, you know, violence that has to, and I particularly have been really involved with the whole idea of this gun violence thing that we have. And, you know, for all the gun people out there, I'm not saying that, you know, you should never have a gun, but I'm saying that truthfully, it's an extension of your body. It's an extension of how we enter into the world. It has a definition. A gun has a definition and it's not inert. And so now we also have the cell phone and the way that um, it also is a weapon it's, it's, it's a weapon of, you know, of witness. It's, a, um, it's an object of witness. And it's one that, like a gun, it can point and shoot. And so the idea in this piece was uh, man down. I was thinking of the community and the world. I mean, we're in an emergency. So when you hear that across a wire, you know, whether it's, you know, if an incident has happened and someone is, um, you know, like in the army, they'll say man down. And it means that there's an emergency and we need all the people to come and help us. And so I was thinking about that term and then I was list, I, well, what, I was thinking about the, the cell phone as the witness. So I have, when you walk around it, you will see my characters. If you see this one down in the right, the left-hand corner there, you see a, a body, a person is holding a, a, a cell phone and the other part, you'll see a gun going one place and they both point and they both shoot. Mm -hmm. And then, so you'll have words in there. It goes, hit, send and then point shoot. And those sounds for me are also what add to the narrative uh, sort of resonance of the piece. And I have those words, you know, going around because in one way, um, and in this one I see it says snapshot. And, I, and I, I like those sort of, those really hard stops after each of the words, snapshot, hit, send, you know, shoot you know point shoot and, and 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 the whole idea again that no witness is innocent once you have seen the thing you can't unsee it and so I think that the whole piece also then have it to be and to have it be beautiful to have it be beautiful because I feel like people are kind of assaulted with things, images and all kinds of things. So if I want people to be part of 
this narrative and to be welcomed in to actually think and feel something that's really hard. I need to make it easy for them to approach it and have layers of ways they can actually um, take in as much as they want or as much as they can bear and then be held. So when you step inside of the piece, it's like I want people to feel like they're held in the light and that they actually, that the light and shadow sort of create this ambience that allows them to just think about something that's a little hard. And it's not against them or for them, it's just what it is. And I'm not actually, even in my pieces, I'm not making value judgments here. I'm just saying, this is what it is. So you think about it the way you want. And I say, that's a bad thing or there's a good thing. It's a thing. And, and you've noted that in your mind, especially with this new body of work, it's the viewer that completes the installation. And you're, in a way, you're already touching on, on why, that, uh, why that is. I, I don't know if you want to add to that, but also on the idea of light and shadow, um, and we, it's fun because was it a year ago that that you uh, went back to me and said, oh yeah, in praise of shadow, uh, Junichiro uh, Tanizaki's book was really insightful um, uh, for me in a whole different context. And we both read it again and we both saw different things in it. But what I'm so struck with the, with the tieback pieces is, of course, there is an inversal kind of an inversion almost. I mean, we start out looking at these beautiful portraits, black paper, kind of backlit with this illumination. We continue this idea of illumination, but but here it's like almost it becomes it becomes something else. Now we're looking at this white structure, and I would imagine also depending on the lighting that the the body of the visitor will cast shadows just as the pattern of that hanging structure casts. Uh, shadow. So I was just wondering if if there's anything else you wanted to add to the theme of light and shadow or the notion of the viewer completing the installation. Well, I think that again, I you know, the time I went to school <laughs> the long time ago, it was all about sometimes the you know the, the work. I had to really come to the decision in my own art practice that actually the viewer was important to me and how the work lives in the world with the viewer interacting with it was part of my process um because that's interesting to me and um i feel that the whole idea of capturing the viewer literally capturing them is something that is part of the seduction mm -hmm. you know I feel like, you know, that's my job. I'm going to seduce you and hold you for a moment, which is actually the one thing that, a, you know, it's a gift. If you can get someone's attention for even three seconds, they've given you something that is, you know, the only thing that a person can give you their attention in that way. And so this whole idea of making them a part of the work and having their shadows be cast on the wall right along with all of the other things that were happening and thinking about um in praise of shadow and i think the other the essay that i wanted that i made you read because you're so kind was james hillman's um notes on white supremacy which was written in 1986 and he was this really famous um uh, Jungian therapist, but in reading those works and realizing how embedded in the world is our, is our mythology of, you know, what comes with light and what comes with dark and, and how in this country, I believe that with Black people, we actually kind of hold a lot of the country's pain. We hold a lot of, of the things that just can't be looked at straight on. And so what my goal, in, at least in my thoughts, is that I would like to have that be shared. I'll give you two-part shadow for one part light so that we 
all kind of are able to exist in the, you know, sort of what the landscape is. And one thing in, I know, like on a day like today, when it's, there's just no, it's kind of, we got this low overcast day in Seattle and there are no shadows. What happens when the sun comes out and all of a sudden the shadows get cast out onto the ground, all of a sudden the world becomes in the round. It becomes like a place where there is depth and there is mystery. And we want that, you know, we want there to be things that we, that are inside our imagination. So it's not a bad thing, but what we do also want is that in how we, to be deliberate in how we introduce what these things mean and it's bigger than us and i don't for one minute think that in one in one show or even one lifetime that i can change that but i can be aware of it and i can share that awareness and then i have to let it go and see how it lives in the world and also i mean i'm glad you're touching on the hellman article uh, or essay again because he he traces how even you know, sometimes we tend to think of light and dark as such abstract principles, but how deeply rooted it is to uh, conceptions of race or gets appropriated that way. So it's really worth rereading. Um, and perhaps some of the people watching will do that. I just want to return to where we started with grace. And I also want to return one more time to this moment we're finding ourselves in. Because as you said earlier, we've been planning this exhibition for over a year. And um, of course, many violent events preceded the death of George Floyd. How are you hoping now, how are you hoping viewers will engage with the exhibition at this time? Well, um, I think that, you know, again, I think my job is to be as clear and as honest as I can be in my work, to try my best not to edit myself, you know, to be appropriate or inappropriate, but in fact, just to tell my truth. And then what I depend on my audience for is to give me back their truth, whatever it is. And I am expecting and hoping to be surprised and to learn something from the comments or the reactions that if I'm, hope, if I'm lucky enough to be in the room with other people when that happens. And that also, that perhaps we together can experience some moments of grace. That also in grace and is, is, is to me kind of a little bit of pre-forgiveness for the fact of our human imperfection because we are so imperfect and we are so not as evolved as we like to think we are. And so that's what we're forgiving ourselves for not being perfect and uh, for perhaps having a chance to do a little rewind and observation and then doing it again. So that's what I'm, I'm hoping. And I've always, it's never failed me. I've always been surprised by people when they walk in. I've always been amazed at the things I learn and the things people see that I've not seen. So I'm looking forward to that. You know, I'm in the studio by myself right now. I miss my cutters. I miss uh, the people who have been here with me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, being open and learning. And I know, uh, Barbara, you're still working on, you know, a number of additional works for the exhibition. We're just sharing a few uh, with uh, people here. And uh, I look forward to be in the presence of these works when you finally open. I think it's going to be very special. And um, I look forward to more reflection and conversation. And I hope that many of the people who are joining us today will be able to um, be there when we open and, um, and will um, come back repeatedly because I think this will be the kind of exhibition you will want to return to. 
to, to be present and be part of this enterprise. So Barbara, thank you so much for your time and thought and um, we'll leave it at that. Well, I thank you all and whoever you are and I'm, I'll be glad when we're Zooming in the same space in, in, in real time. In real time. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Thank Take you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.